Well, greetings, friends. Uh, friends, we come out here this morning to uh, bring to you the gospel of grace, the good news that Jesus Christ is Lord, that He is the King of glory, and that He is calling a people unto Himself, that He is calling His sheep out uh, by His own power, that He is calling out to them and they are coming to Him. And friends, we come out here knowing that uh, that there are perhaps among you God's sheep who have yet to be brought into the fold. Those for whom Christ has died, has laid down His life. And so we come out here in faith, trusting that God, if He is pleased, will draw you to His Son in saving faith. That, he, that you will turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. We plead with you to repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. We know that Jesus came. Jesus Himself came preaching to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He said the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's Mark 1.15. We know that John the Baptist preached repentance. Now repentance is turning from sin and unto God with grief and hatred for that sin and with full endeavor after new obedience. And friends, we come out here pleading with you to turn from your sins and to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ who died for the sins of His church. My friends, many people, many religious leaders, many liberal uh, religious leaders are preaching peace and safety. But my friends, there is no peace with the wicked. There is no peace with the wicked. We come preaching peace in Jesus Christ. He is the Prince of Peace who brings peace to His people, peace with God. See friends, if you are like me, which I know that you are. You've been born in sin. You've been born as a sinner. We know that uh, David said in Psalm 51, In sin did my mother conceive me. Even from conception, we are utterly depraved. We are totally, totally altogether wicked and evil. Haters of God. We know Paul says that in Romans 3. And so we need forgiveness. We need peace with God. We need to be made right with our Creator. And that is accomplished through Christ's atonement upon the cross. Through Christ's death upon the cross, Jesus satisfied the wrath of God and rose again three days later. What does the prophet Isaiah say in Isaiah 53? He speaks of Christ in verse 7. He says He was oppressed and He was afflicted, yet He did not open His mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. We know it says in verse 9, His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with the rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. My friends, Jesus Christ was utterly innocent, perfect in all his ways, and righteous in all his deeds, yet he died the death of an evil man. He died, though innocent, treated as guilty. Though righteous, treated as a sinner. So that sinners could be treated as righteous. He who was rich became poor, so that we might be made rich spiritually. Christ came to give us riches, yes, but not riches according to the world. According to the, what, what the world thinks riches are. But my friend, spiritual riches. Christ came to make us rich in faith. Christ came to give us a righteousness that we could not have on our own, that we could not procure for our own selves, and that is His own righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that righteousness is the righteousness that you need. What does the book of Proverbs say? Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Friends, we need to be wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ in the eyes of God so that when God looks at us, He sees the perfect garment of His own Son's righteousness. He sees Christ. We know that that is what Paul meant when he said in Romans 8.1, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Friend, are you in Christ? Are you seen by God as in Jesus? As wrapped in Christ's righteousness? Otherwise, you are naked and poor and miserable. And God sees you wanting. You are found wanting in the eyes of God. It's because of His holiness. It's because God dwells in light that is unapproachable. We know the Scriptures say that He is so holy, He cannot tolerate sin, that He is a consuming fire, a jealous God. 
jealous for his own glory, jealous for justice. And so God holds men accountable according to his holy law, his Ten Commandments. And we are found, all of us, as sinners in the hands of an angry God. God is merciful and God is gracious. God is love. We know that from 1 John. But friend, do not forget this, that God is a God of anger and that God has anger. God is angry with the wicked every day. But at the cross of Jesus Christ, that anger was unleashed. That wrath, that holy justice was put on Jesus Christ. So that, going back to Isaiah 3, the prophet could write in verse 10, but Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Listen to verse 11. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. My friends, Jesus Christ suffered great agonies in his very soul upon the cross. And God the Father here is saying, through the prophet Isaiah, that as a result of Christ's anguish of soul, many will be justified. Verse 12 says, Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. My friends, there is one intercessor. There is one mediator between God and man. And that is the man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory. There is no other mediator. There is no other person that can stand between God and man. There is no hope in the Pope. There's no hope in a priest or a pastor or a self-proclaimed prophet or apostle. There is only hope in the one, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one mediator. And this Christ rose again on the third day. He is alive, my friends. He is alive. He has defeated death. He has shown that he is victorious over the grave, that he has the power to destroy death itself, that it cannot hold him. And so he calls unto sinners. What does he say? Matthew 11. He says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My friends, Jesus Christ bids you to come and to rest, to find rest for your weary soul. See, your sin in which you live, Drunkenness and your idolatry, your drug abuse, your sexual immorality. It does not satisfy. The pornography that you view does not satisfy. Speaking in a disrespectful manner toward those are, who are around you, it does not satisfy. It promises to give you joy and contentment. Sin makes many promises, my friends, but it cannot deliver on its promises. But rather, my friends, God has made many promises and every single one of them shall be fulfilled. We ought to hinge our eternity upon the promises of God. My friends, if you are to come unto Christ, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and come after Jesus Christ. And He promises to forgive all your sins, past, present, and future, and to wrap you in His righteousness, to adopt you into the family of God, to engraft you into Israel, into God's people, and to bring you safely into His kingdom. My friends, we are all going to die. If the Lord Jesus continues to tarry in His return, we are all going to face God. We're going to have to pass through the veil which is called death and stand before our Creator. My friends, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So we plead with great urgency, do not lose your soul for your sins. Do not go another day as you are, my friends. Every moment that passes by is a moment that is closer to Judgment Day. The day in which God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. 
And my friends, your deeds will be found out. The things which you have done in secret will be brought to light. And that's why you need Jesus Christ's forgiveness, which is available. It is free. It is a free forgiveness. It is not a forgiveness which you have to pay for. It is not a forgiveness that you have to bargain for or even go to another man to obtain. Rather, you go to Christ directly. We go to Jesus Christ in prayer, pleading for forgiveness. And what does the book of 1 John say? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a promise, my friends. Will you not come to this Christ? Will you not come and believe upon Christ? Will you not give up your life, give up all your worldly pleasures, and pursue the Son of God who promises to give us pleasures forevermore? Isn't that interesting? What an interesting dynamic. Christ says, deny yourself. We are to give up all the worldly pleasures. But listen. He says, God says in the Old Testament that in His presence are pleasures and joy forevermore. So my friends, we say come freely, without money and without cost. Speaking of Isaiah, as I just read out of Isaiah 53, Isaiah 55 says this in verse 1, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. Verse 6, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord and He will have compassion on him. And to our God, for He will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways you, uh, nor are your ways my ways, declares Yahweh. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Such is the nature of God, that though He is holy and righteous, He can administer grace and mercy. He can show love toward His cre creation which has fallen into sin. He can show love toward the sinner because He has authorized His grace through the atonement of His Son. If Jesus had not died, God could show us no mercy. We would have to receive justice. We would have to receive judgment in hell forever. But Jesus Christ received judgment on our behalf, on behalf of His people. See, Jesus loves His bride with a great love. Jesus loves His church with a great love. What does Paul say to the men at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25? He says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her. See, Jesus chose a people before the world was made to save. Jesus loved this elect people. Jesus loved this people and so He was compelled to go to the cross and to die. And therefore we have joy in our hearts, my friends. We have joy knowing that Jesus Christ has died, yes, and He has risen, yes, and that He has ascended. He has ascended into heaven and He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high in heaven. What does Hebrews 1 say? It says that very thing. At the end of Hebrews it says He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Who has the right to sit down at such a lofty position, at such an exalted place? It is none other than God. None other than God the Son, Jesus, the Lord Christ. See, my friends, sin kills, but Jesus saves. Sin kills. Sin destroys your life in this life, and it destroys your life in the life to come. It will bring you hell. 
See, God does not turn a blind eye to the evil things which men do, to the wicked things that you and I do. Even for those who are in Christ, it's not like God sweeps our sin under the rug and forgets about it. Rather, He publicly, publicly has sought to punish that sin and He did it at the cross of Calvary. That's what Paul is getting at in Romans 3. He says in Romans 3, speaking of Christ in verse 25, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. That is, a propitiation is that which absorbs wrath, which appeases God. Christ is our propitiation. We know that from the book of 1 John chapter 2. And He was displayed publicly as a propitiation. Not in the dark, not in a corner, but out in the open so that we can look unto Christ and see the Son of God lifted up. See, my friends, in the Old Testament, the Israelites sinned against God and so God sent a plague. He sent fiery serpents to bite the Israelites and many of them died. But then God told Moses to put up a bronze serpent on a, on a staff, on a pole. And everyone who looked to the bronze serpent would be forgiven or would be, um, would be saved from the, from the venom of the snake, would be, would be saved from the, the deadly bite of the serpents. And we know that that was a type of Jesus Christ. That that was a foreshadowing of what Jesus was coming to do. That He was coming to be put upon the cross. To be pinned upon the cross of Calvary. So that we could look. That we could look in faith to what He has done. And have salvation. We know because Jesus said that very thing in John. In John chapter 3. He says in verse 14. Jesus speaking here. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 18, He who believes in Him is not judged, he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. My friends, if you reject Christ, the judgment has already been passed. If you continue on in your sin, your love for the things of the world, your love for listening to music which God hates, watching things on YouTube that displease God, then the judgment has already been passed. The wrath of God is upon your very heads. And it is only out of the great mercy of our infinite Creator, the God of glory, that you yourselves are not in hell. That I am not in hell. God is giving you time. Time is something which you cannot waste. For once it is gone, it cannot be regained. Please, don't lose your soul. Don't lose your soul for your sins. My friends, your soul, once it is lost, it cannot be regained. Once in hell, there is no exiting hell. Once passing in to that place of torment, you cannot exit. To gain access into the facility, please proceed to the security screening area and have your ticket or Friends, Jesus Christ said, Everyone who sins is the slave of sin. But if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Friends, you are slaves. Slaves to your sin. Slaves to your own self-interest. You know, there's a lot of talk these days about narcissism being a, a disorder in the mind. And there's certainly people who have issues on a psychological level, on a physical level with that. But my friends, we're all narcissists. We're all born as narcissists, in love with ourselves, in love with our own self-image. Egos larger than we can possibly fathom. And we need to be humbled. We need to be humbled by God's grace. We need to be humbled by God's mercy. My friends, God is opposed to the proud, but He gives grace. He gives grace, my dear friends, to the humble. I call you dear friends, not because I know you necessarily, not because I'm familiar with you. I may not know you from anywhere. 
But my friends, I call you friends because I care for your soul. I wouldn't stand out here and preach my heart out if I didn't care for you. If I didn't desire that you yourselves be born a second time, that you be born of the Spirit. And that's what you must be if you were to see God's kingdom. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot comprehend spiritual things. I think about I myself being a false convert, being a false Christian for seven years, saying that I knew Jesus Christ, but I did not truly know Him. I lived in hypocrisy, pride and selfishness and worldly pleasures and lusts. My friends, I thought I knew Christ, but I was greatly deceived, self-deceived. And my friends, many of you can be self-deceived. Many of you can claim to know Jesus Christ. Many of you can go to church, be baptized, even be involved in church activities, church leadership. But my friends, if you have not been born again, if you have not been born a second time, it will be all in vain. For all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags in the sight of God. On that day of judgment of which I spoke earlier, there will be many who say Jesus is their Lord. And He will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. My friends, there are many, perhaps even within sound of my voice, who claim to know Christ, but they live as though the law of God does not exist. They live as though Christ never gave a law to obey. And my friends, God does have commands. God does have a moral code by which we ought to live. Not that we might be saved. We are saved by grace, freely by grace. But my friends, once someone is born again, once someone is born anew of the Spirit, they now desire the things of God. They now hunger and thirst for righteousness. When we read the Beatitudes, what do we see there? Not the way of salvation, rather the fruit of salvation. We ought to have the beatitude attitude, my friends. We ought to have that disposition within our souls that we hunger and thirst for righteousness, that we love God and we love our fellow man, that we love the truth of God's Word, that we love to pray and fellowship with God's people because God has done a work of grace in us. See, my friends, that's what the whole book of 1 John is about. And I exhort you, if you name the name of Jesus Christ, if you take upon yourself the name of the Lord, I encourage you to go home today and to study the book of 1 John, to study yourself in light of that book and to see whether your profession of faith in Christ is legitimate. To see whether your profession of faith in Christ holds up under the scrutiny of God's Word. And if not, if you are found to be a hypocrite like I once was, the promise still holds true. Acts 2.20 For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's taken out of Joel 2. This is an Old and New Testament promise. My friends, it is a fearful thing, as I mentioned earlier, to fall into the hands of the living God. Jesus gave stern warnings about false Christians and they are everywhere. They're all around us. Jesus said in Matthew 7, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now why were these people denied access into God's kingdom? Because they put their trust in their works. They put their confidence in their deeds. They thought that in God's sight they could be justified if they performed a certain way. But my friends, their trust was not founded upon the rock. They were not resting upon the rock of ages, the Lord of righteousness, the King of glory. They were not looking to the Lion of Judah. They were not looking to the last Adam, to Jesus Christ. They were looking inward. They were looking inward to satisfy their consciences, which scream out to them concerning their guilt. My friends, if you claim to know Christ, but you rest in your own righteousness, you are hopeless. Hopeless. Friends, what you must have is trust in Jesus Christ. Look to Christ. 
Look to the Son of God, to Jesus Christ. What does Acts 16.31 say? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Romans 4.5 For the one who does not work, but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Verse 3 For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. I went down. My friends, I plead with you. I beg of you. In no uncertain terms to come to Christ and live and have life eternal. See, Jesus does not provide us with a temporary salvation, one that we can lose. But He provides us with life eternal. With a salvation that shall never be taken away. Thank you. Jesus said concerning His sheep, He said, I give them life eternal. And what a glorious gift that is. And not only has Christ done this in the past, but He is coming again soon one day. My, my friends, Jesus Christ is soon to return. And when He comes, He will wage war against His enemies. He will come not to bring salvation, not to atone for sin, but rather to judge the enemies of God. So there's an urgency. There's a greater urgency with the preaching of the Gospel. Revelation 19. John describes to us what Jesus will look like. He says in verse 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. Quite ironic. My friends, we're here to watch horses race. I'm telling you that Christ is going to come back riding on a white horse. This is the horse that we ought to place emphasis on. Not the ones here at this race, but the one that Christ is going to come riding back on. And it says, And he who sat on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with the, clothed with the robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. My friends, this is fearful, but Jesus Christ today, through his word, speaks. He speaks right here, my friends. Don't go seeking after visions and dreams and bizarre voices in your head like Sarah Young with her heresy, Jesus Calling. Rather, Jesus is calling through this, through this book, the inspired Word of God, my friends. And He says this, Come, come and have grace. Have grace upon grace. John said, For of His fullness we have received, and grace upon grace upon grace. My friends, it's abundant. But if you reject His mercy today, and His love, if you reject the love of God as it is revealed in Jesus Christ, there is only judgment and wrath. We care about you, friends. We're praying for you. We have tracks. We want to deal with you concerning your soul. Come, my friends, come speak with us. We want to talk with you about Christ. We want to talk with you about spiritual things. We want to be honest. We want to be honest. We don't want to lie. We don't want to soothe you with lies. We'd rather wound you with the truth than comfort and soothe your conscience with a lie. Rather, we want you to be exposed to the truth so that your sin might be exposed and removed and you wrapped in Christ's perfect righteousness. Now, why would Christ do such a thing? Why would Christ die? Why would Christ live a life of perfect obedience? Why would Jesus even bother saving us? Why would God even bother with sinful humanity? It's for one reason. It's to one end. And that's His glory. God is for His own glory. God is for God. God is for Himself. God is jealous to bring His name glory. And it pleases Him and it glorifies Him to have set apart a people before the world was made unto Himself. And then in due time to send His Son into the world to enact the covenant of grace by the shedding of His own blood. 
and then to draw people to himself by the power of his Holy Spirit to establish a kingdom of priests unto himself who will reign with him forever and ever. It pleased God to do this because it glorifies him. And that is what we ought to live to. That's the end to which we ought to live to the glory of God. In fact, I invite you today to glorify God with us, my friends, to give God the glory for the great things that He has done. As the old hymn says, to God be the glory, great things He has done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life an atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may come in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear His voice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory for the great things He has done. And so we say, to God be glory, praise and honor forevermore. Amen. Amen.